Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. We're very pleased uh, that you are joining us. And I think in the interest of time, we will go ahead and get started uh, in the hopes that other colleagues uh, will join us uh, as we proceed. Um, if you haven't already, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, and we wanted to remind everyone that the event is being recorded and also encourage you uh, throughout the presentation to go ahead and put your questions uh, that you may have in the chat box. Um, and of course, there will also be a question and answer period uh, at the end where uh, we will uh, review the chat box questions. And of course, you can uh, also just ask your questions at that point as well. Uh, so I'm Mary Margaret Deneen. I'm the director of the Global Programs Division at ABA Rowley. And I'm here with uh, Siddharth Divakaruni, who is the program associate who's been supporting the Riches Program uh, for ABA Rowley. And we also have with us the ABA Rowley consultants uh, who have been working on the Riches Program and representatives from the Grameen Foundation who lead the program. And all of them will be introduced uh, shortly and their bios were also included in the agenda that was attached uh, to the invitation. And we're pleased uh, to have had the opportunity to extend the invitation to ABA Rowley Global staff, as well as ABA colleagues uh, from various commissions and centers uh, across the association, including the Women's Interest Network, the Center for Children and the Law, the Center for Human Rights, uh, the Commission on Immigration, and the Commission on Women in the Profession. We wanted to take this opportunity to share the reducing the incidence of child labor and harmful conditions of work in economic strengthening initiatives, the RICHES program, with you to raise awareness about the issue, especially since this is the year of, this, is the, this year is the International Year for Elimination of Child Labor. And we're so glad that you're able to join us specifically for an introduction to the Riches Toolkit, which provides practical resources for doing just that. Understanding, mitigating, preventing child harm and promoting child protection. In partnership with the Grameen Foundation, uh, who leads the Riches program, A.B. Rowley has supported expert consultants, uh, two of whom are presenting today and others who've also worked at the country level to develop the toolkit. And Grameen is also a partner uh, with uh, ABA Rowley uh, in the Women and Girls Empowered Program, the, the WAGE program, which is a global consortium that Rowley leads to advance the status of women and girls. And WAGE is just one of several programs implemented by ABA Rowley focused on reducing the barriers to women's economic participation and access to justice. And while the toolkit is targeted toward women's economic empowerment actors, given the underlying importance of do no harm and safeguarding to our work more broadly, and the, the imperative of child protection is recognized across all programs. We hope uh, that after today's discussion, you may think differently and more expansively about preventing child harm and promoting child protection and also that you'll see ways in which the toolkit can be a resource for you directly in your day-to-day -day work with program partners, or how perhaps there may be aspects that could be adapted to complement and to bolster your efforts. Uh, so I am happy now to turn the floor over to Siddharth, who will provide a brief introduction of the presenters for this morning's program. Welcome again. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's nice to see you all virtually. Uh, as Mary Margaret said, I wanted to give um, say a few words about each of our presenters today from both ABA Rowley and the Grameen Foundation. Uh, we have four presenters today, uh, and I'll start with one um, with our first, Amelia Kuklevitz, who is our regional direct, who is um, the regional director for Lack and Asia at the Grameen Foundation. Amelia has 18 years of experience managing projects in financial inclusion, women's economic empowerment, and social performance management. In addition, she has led a number of US government projects and has been instrumental in developing Grameen Foundation's Resilient Life, Resilient Business Curriculum, tools for mitigating the risks of unintended consequences of economic strengthening initiatives, such as the Riches Toolkit, which we're talking about today, as well as gender toolkits and safeguarding policies. 
Secondly, we have Bobby Gray, Research Director at the Grameen Foundation. Uh, Bobby Gray has over 15 years of experience collaborating and coordinating research evaluation and monitoring activities with in-country research teams, academic researchers, and partner organizations, which include microfinance institutions and part in partner organizations um, uh, in across Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Uh, she also supports um, the WAGE program as part of the WAGE consortium, as Mary Margaret had mentioned, um, as well as the Riches program. And much of her recent work has been focused on researching and evaluating digital agriculture programs, such as training tools for women's empowerment in agriculture. Next, we have Chris Camillo, um, an international technical expert um, 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 from ABA Roley. Uh, she oversees primarily um, our uh, activities in the Latin America region. Um, and prior to being on this program, Chris conducted performance audits of US Department of Labor funded international child labor projects, as well as served as a division director for operations in the Department of Labor's Office of uh, Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor, and Human Trafficking. Early in her career, she was also an international labor officer with the U.S. Department of State. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we have who is an international technical expert uh, with ABA Roley, um, covering project initiatives um, primarily in the Philippines. Deepa has um, over 20 years of experience in um, the child labor, education, um, and community development spheres. She has worked on child labor issues at USDOL um, for over, she had worked on child labor issues at USDOL for over seven years, conducting needs assessments, developing solicitations, managing projects, and overseeing financial and performance audits of USDOL funded child labor projects. She has also worked on education, teacher training, and community development initiatives with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, as well as served as a, a project director with the US Peace Corps. Um, and with that, I wanted to turn it over to the Riches team. Uh, thank you again so much. Thanks, Siddharth. Um, so I'm gonna start off and what we are um, gonna start with today is making the case. Um, Achieving safe and healthy business growth for women, protecting women and children within the women's economic empowerment initiatives. And this present presentation seeks to develop the foundation for we actors to see an urgent, relevant, and feasible pathway for integrating child protection and business safety and health into their programming through an expanded view of client, client protection and specifically child protection. Can we go to the next slide? So addressing harmful work for children and adults as unintended consequences of investing in women's economic empowerment, or WE, is expanding the definition of client protection to include harm that can be experienced by the household and specifically by children. So the purpose of this presentation is to make the case for integrating child protection and business safety and health measures into WE initiatives and demonstrating practical actions that we actors can take to mitigate the risk of their programs doing harm. So through this presentation, you will identify challenges that women, sorry, I think I got muted. Um, identify challenges that female entrepreneurs face as business owners, unpack the research of unintended consequences for we programming, and identify a pathway for taking practical steps to integrate child protection and business safety and health into WE programming and to motivate you to action. Next slide. So first, let's understand the characteristics of women's businesses in general around the world. In 2016, it was estimated that 274 million women in 74 economies were starting or running a business. This had grown 10% from two years, pre, pre, sorry, two years prior. On average, women exhibit 20% or greater likelihood of starting a business out of necessity compared to men. 
Globally, the most prevalent age group for women starting businesses is either the 25 to 34 or the 35 to 44 age range, which occurs during the ch women's childbearing years. Women are more likely than men to resort to entrepreneurship for the flexibility it offers in terms of balancing work and family responsibilities. Women spend twice as much time as men on domestic tasks. In developing countries, 39% of employed women said that they themselves look after their children while they work. The new emergence of the COVID-19 virus further threatens the viability and success of women's enterprises as they face lockdowns, since they generally work in the informal sector and are disproportionately impacted by caretaking duties. The International Labor Organization, or the ILO, estimates that 1.6 billion workers in the informal economy, nearly half of the global workforce and many of whom are women, stand in immediate danger of having their livelihoods destroyed due to COVID-19, reversing progress that has been made to improve women's opportunities to start and grow businesses. Next slide, please. So there are both facilitators and barriers to women's entrepreneurship, and we're gonna look at a few of each. The evidence-based facilitators that promote women's entrepreneurship and economic development include business coaching and mentoring, education and skills training, access to capital when starting a new business or maintaining an established one. Microcredit also helps women in the long run by expanding their businesses and increasing their flexibility to deal with financial shocks. Savings, bundled services, for example, business education, financial services, and mentoring, networks and mentors, conditional cash transfers, subsidized and affordable childcare, and programs that address family responsibilities and work-life balance, and rural electrification. On the flip side, there are some ba barriers that can inhibit women's entrepreneurship, and these include overall gender bias within the household, community, and institutions, social and cultural norms, including religious beliefs and expectations of women's roles in the business and in the home, balancing the competing demands of family and work, the availability of childcare, legal constraints, and a lack of business resources such as finances, capital, training, and development. And it's important to note that Child care is listed on both sides. It can be a facilitator and the lack of adequate child care can be a barrier. Next slide. So in the next section, we're gonna look at a global overview of harmful work for children. And I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. First thing I'd like you to do is take a look at this picture. I took this picture while I was on a trip to Rwanda and I was visiting a school on the day that I took it. And you can see these children, um, they're young children, and they were in a situation that I would consider um, harmful child work. Um, they were young, um, they were working with animals which could pose health and safety risks to them. And they were not being supervised by adults and they were not attending school. So although I took this picture in Africa, we know from research that child labor occurs or harmful child work occurs in every region of the world. And although it's very prevalent in agriculture, we know that harmful child work exists in the service sector as well as in the industrial sector. Um, it tends to be more prevalent in rural areas, in the informal sector, in regions where there is instability and insecurity and high poverty. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about some of the definitions uh, that we use, um, child work versus harmful child work in particular. And what I do is I try to think about three things when I'm thinking about whether a situation is child work or harmful child work. I think about, first of all, the work situation, the education status of the child, and also the child's age. So if you look on the left, when we think about child work, uh, we think about household chores and forms of legal work, including light work. Um, child work is beneficial uh, for the child's development, can be beneficial for the child's development. It's the type of work that does not interfere with schooling. 
Um, in terms of international standards, uh, child work is, light work is, is acceptable at the age of 13. Uh, although in some developing countries, they've set the age at 12. And in terms of non-hazardous work, the international standard is 15 for the minimum age. Although in some countries, developing countries, uh, an age of 14 is used. Now let's look at harmful child work or child labor. This is children engaged in work that's physically, mentally, and morally dangerous and harmful. It's work that interferes with their schooling. So when I think about harmful child work, I try to remember the three Ds. Any work that is um, difficult, dangerous, and dirty. And internationally, um, there's a minimum age of 18 for hazardous work. Although um, countries are able to set or determine the types and conditions of work that they consider to be hazardous. Next slide. So here are some global statistics about child protection and child, harmful child work. In the year 2020, there were an estimated 160 million children engaged in harmful work around the world. In 60% of households that face an income shock, an unexpected funeral expense, an unexpected um, illness that doesn't enable the, the, um, the head of household to work, they will resort to harmful child work. When families are in a situation where they need income, they will turn to those who are closest to them. In 72% of harmful child work occurs within families. And this is a very surprising statistic for many people. Many people think that harmful child work is egregious work. Uh, it's child trafficking, it's slavery. It's the type of work that doesn't involve family members and isn't done with the knowledge of family members. However, again, many, many children are working for their families on family farms or in family microenterprises. Looking at the bottom, 1.6 million school children have been affected by COVID-19 shutdowns. That's a huge number. Although this year, many children have gone back to in-person learning and some children are involved in virtual learning, there are millions of children around the world who are still not attending school. Four out of 10 young workers, and by this we mean workers under the age of 26, were working in vulnerable sectors when COVID-19 hit. And by vulnerable sectors, we mean sectors with low pay, few or no benefits, and limited or no job security. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna look at the intersection. Hey, Chris, there's a question, um, and I wonder if you wanna answer it now about um, a category of child labor or, ha or hazardous work that's not physically hazardous, but it can include things like commercial sexual exploitation or things that are emotionally and psychologically harmful. Um, I think this person is referring to the worst forms of child labor, and there are various worst forms of child labor, um, all categories of, of types of slavery, um, commercial sexual exploitation. Um, we include armed Same. conflict. Um, children working in drug trafficking um, and hazardous labor, hazardous labor being the largest category within the worst forms of child labor. So child labor, um, the, these worst forms of child labor are a subset of child labor, which we, for, um, for public purposes, are using the term harmful child work instead of child labor. But all of these things um, that are either physically, morally, or emotionally damaging to children fall under the category of harmful child work. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the intersection of women's entrepreneurship and child protection. Next slide, please. There hasn't been much research done on this area. Um, sometimes, there has been research done on, on what might be the harmful effects of women's entrepreneurship on adults. However, not much has been done on the effects of um, women's entrepreneurship on children. But first, let's look at some of the intended consequences for women's entrepreneurship. Some of the goals of women's entrepreneurship are to support women in business startup and growth, to help them achieve economic and financial autonomy, um, to promote women's empowerment, household resilience, and poverty alleviation, the achievement of household financial goals, education for children, food security, 
and ensuring healthy and happy families. However, sometimes there are unintended consequences, which we've listed on the right. When women take on loans, particularly microcredit loans, they can become over indebted. Due to the over indebtedness, they can start to feel financial stress. Financial stress can sometimes lead to household discord and even violence against women. As women try to juggle the demands of their business with the demands of childcare, they face increased labor burdens. In one country that we researched, women were working an average of 12 hours a day. So they were working seven hours in their business as well as five hours in childcare. They were exhausted and they felt quite a bit of stress. Women who are starting businesses often don't have the means to provide for good health and safety in their businesses. They're not sure how to do that or they don't have the resources. So harmful working conditions for adults in the business are present. There are also harmful work, child work conditions in terms of women are involving their children in the work because they need the help, because their children provide low or no cost labor, because they trust their children to do the work or their children are there when they are working. So they're present in the business and exposed to harm. There are also situations of envir de environmental degradation that occur and other types of gender-based violence. Sometimes women are, when they're out running businesses, they're exposed to extortion um, and other types of crimes. And finally, a very sad unintended consequence may be suicide as women feel incredible financial pressure. Next slide. So what our research showed are some characteristics of um, the intersection of child labor and we. Women choose enterprises that allow them to balance caretaking and income generation. Again, women are starting businesses largely when they're in their childbearing years, but they have childcare responsibilities and they have to, they end up exposing their children to unsafe working conditions as a result. Children often take on caretaking responsibilities to help their parents, to free up their parents to pursue income generation. Older children in particular are often asked to take care of younger children while their moms are working. Girls in particular, especially in traditional societies, are pulled in to take on these caretaking responsibilities and they can interfere with a child's education. A child may be asked to stay home for an entire day to take care of siblings so their parents can work. Children provide, as we said, no or low cost labor. They do low skilled work that businesses need and they help increase the profitability of businesses. Next slide. Now let's look at the relationship between harmful child work and business growth. On the left-hand side, we have some of the characteristics of businesses that can increase the risk of harmful child work. For example, there's an increased risk of harmful child work when a business is new, when it is small, when it is home-based, when it is agricultural-based, when a woman is in the position where she has to balance childcare with the responsibilities of work, when the business has new assets, when it has new debts, children become a type of household self-insurance. Now let's look at the other side. When is there a decreased risk of harmful child work? Well, it's when the business starts growing, when the business becomes larger, often when the business is, has a legal stature, um, when it's based outside the home, and when the work of the business is more specialized, when assets are accumulated in the business and the business owner is using a variety of financial instruments. Next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about push and pull factors for harmful child work that are relevant for reactors. What is pushing people into harmful child work? Well, poverty is a big factor. Also various types of health shocks, income shocks and stresses, and income earners disability or death. Lack of social protection, lack of health insurance, lack of childcare and other types of protection. Also, this is a big factor, poorly designed financial products and services. Many times financial products and services have aggressive loan recovery policies. They, they're lacking in, in refinance options in times of income shocks. They have short loan repayment periods. There's a high cost of borrowing, high interest rates, and loan sizes are too small. 
On the other side, there are pull factors. When there's an economic opportunity, families want to take advantage of that for income generation. Also the nature of businesses. If you look at agricultural businesses, they operate during certain peak times, during certain seasons, when all members of the family may be pulled in to help. That can increase the risk of harmful child work. Access to microfinance, although it can be helpful for starting a business, it increases the demand many times for child labor. Work and education preferences. Many families want their children to get some type of work experience. So they see this as beneficial. Also, in some situations, there are preferences, for example, for boys to go to school as opposed to girls to go to school. So girls are at home and they're engaged in harmful child work. We've talked a little bit more about the, the balancing of caretaking and income generation, but um, we have to say it again that, that there, is a, there is a very delicate balance uh, to try to, to balance caretaking with income generation. There are a lot of demands on women and they have to do both in many situations. Um, women who don't have much decision-making power sometimes have no choice but to have their children work and not attend school. And there's a lack of awareness, a big lack of awareness at the community level about harmful child work. And there's also a lack of awareness among MFIs of harmful child work. Harmful child work, again, is often seen as egregious forms of work. It's not seen as the work that children do for their families and with their mothers. And there are many societal pressures and norms for children to work. Sometimes it is just considered to be a cultural uh, norm for children. Uh, one country that I visited uh, told me that the child is actually translated in the local language as young worker. So it is very typical and very traditional for children to engage in work. Next slide, please. Now Deepa is going to introduce a video that we um, completed with the Riches Project. Thanks, Chris. Um, so the Riches Project has produced a series of six videos on managing various risks in the business um, in order to make the message a little bit more accessible to women clients around the world and to distill it in a way that is more accessible to them and offers solutions. Um, so the six videos cover the areas of physical risks, chemical risks, threat to education and emotional and uh, psychological risks, risk to growth and development, and the threat of human trafficking. These videos are all available on YouTube in English, Spanish, French, and Tagalog. Um, the animation in English and Spanish, in English and French are the same, and the animation is different for the Spanish and Tagalog versions. So today we're going to watch, um, these, these videos are all about three to four minutes in length, so they shouldn't require too much bandwidth for the clients to watch. Um, today we're going to watch the one on chemical risks um, and the English video. Siddharth, so can you play it? Edward and Sophie learn to manage the chemical risk at their business. Sophie and her husband, Edward, are concerned about a disease that has impacted the plantain farms in their region. Together, they agree that the whole family would apply pesticides to quickly protect their farm. Today, Edward went to a meeting to learn how to use pesticides and when he came back, he told Sophie about the chemical risks that business owners, their children and employees face, such as using toxic chemicals such as pesticides, fertilizers, dyes or cleaning solutions such as bleach, exposure to biological hazards such as blood, feces, manure and germs respiratory hazards from inhaling smoke, vapors, or gases. These risks can cause permanent injury or disability. For example, children's brains can be irreversibly damaged if the mother is exposed to toxic substances while pregnant. 
it is important to remember two of the D's of prohibited work for people under 18, dirty and dangerous. Dirty work including exposure to feces, manure or germs. Dangerous work that requires them to breathe in, handle or transport toxic chemicals. Edward also learned about two steps he could take to reduce chemical risks. 1. Identify the risks by answering the questions. What chemical risks do people face at the business on a daily basis? What are the specific risks children face when helping or when present at the business? 2. Manage the risks. After identifying the risks, it is important to answer the question, how do I eliminate these risks? Some ways to eliminate chemical risks are use protective clothing and equipment when handling chemical and biological products, ensure that work equipment is in good condition, improve ventilation and protect children and adults from smoke. Keep chemicals stored in suitable containers, properly labeled and in a safe place. Supervise children to protect them from using or being exposed to chemicals. Since Sophie is pregnant and her children are under 18, they will not be allowed to apply the pesticides. Instead, they will help with the housework. Meanwhile, Edward asked other farmers to help him apply the pesticide to eliminate the risk to his wife and children. Now, Edward and Sophie are more prepared because they know how to protect themselves and their children. So before we move on with the presentation, um, I'd love to get people's reactions and thoughts to the video. You can unmute yourselves or put it in the chat, Giovanni. Okay, sorry, I thought you had your hand raised. Any reactions to the video? What did you think? Amelia, there's a question about how are the videos disseminated and reaching the affected communities? Do you want to address that? Sure. Um, so we are, we're working through um, different types of women's economic empowerment actors. And so um, the idea is that as part of, you know, whether we're working with microfinance organizations, a savings groups organization or an NGO, is that we provide um, access um, to the videos that can be done either um, sent directly. Um, so we have a, a program called Seven Taps where we can directly send it to a woman entrepreneur through a link or a QR code, or they can be accompanied by a field officer staff. So if someone is going to um, visit the business then they can kind of have the interaction with, um, with uh, the education. So this video sits within a micro learning um, platform basically that also has some questions on each side, some reflection pieces and some commitments towards action. And so um, they can be used in both ways, directly to, a, to an entrepreneur or kind of through some sort of, uh, of a facilitation. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Andrea? Thank you very much. I'm just wondering if you've used this video already and what the reactions have been. I can take that as well. Yes, we have. We just did last week. Um, uh, uh, we've used it in a couple of places in El Salvador and the Philippines as well as um, in Nigeria. But our, our latest experience was um, with the um, fishing sector in the Philippines. And so we, um, we had uh, various people who are concerned specifically um, from government level NGO as well as um, some of the private sector that um, were looking at the videos to be able to implement them um, and found them really 
easy and illustrative to use. The, the benefit of also having them on YouTube as well as in some cases where that YouTube is subsidized, we found that they, they thought that was really a great way to be able to access it without um, the data issue that sometimes comes in place. But um, yeah, they had mentioned that it was really kind of to the point and, and colorful and people um, got to use it really well. We also uh, trained a hundred women uh, as well in the Philippines on, um, so actual women entrepreneurs on this. And so from that, we had some um, positive upticks in both um, knowledge, knowledge change and a little bit of attitude change as well after seeing, seeing the series. Of, of six topics. Thanks for that question. Yes, so there was a question about if the material is available in Spanish, and it absolutely is. It's available. The videos, all six videos, have been produced in English, Spanish, French, and Tagalog, and they are all available on YouTube. Um, and we can send the link out later. Other questions? Okay. So we can go on to the next slide. So we've so far we've talked about um, the evidence that supports the relationship between women's entrepreneurship and the un unintended consequences that can be caused by supporting women's businesses. And now we're going to look at why um, we actors should get involved and what are some of the practical things that we can do to address some of these unintended consequences. Next slide. So women's empower economic empowerment actors, we actors, have a responsibility to ensure that the products and services that are provided to clients and the delivery of those products and services do not cause or exacerbate harmful child work or harmful working conditions. To do this, we must be aware of the risks of harmful child work and harmful working conditions assess the risks of harmful work for children and adults in our portfolios, commit to do no harm principles, and know where to go for help. And the opportunity that acting um, provides for us is that particularly for financial service providers or other market-based actors, by better meeting the financial investment and protection needs of women entrepreneurs through the provision of a full and improved suite of financial services, contributing to the financial, social, and environmental bottom line of we actors. And we have an opportunity to be part of the solution, not the problem. Um, one thing that our research and our field work showed us was that there are a plethora of actors working on harmful child work issues and child protection issues. And there are equally as many actors, including government actors, working on women's economic empowerment and promoting women's entrepreneurship but very few of them are working together and very few of them are even aware of the other issues. And so trying to bring the two interventions together is part of what we are trying to do with the Riches Project. And yes, you can go ahead on to the next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Amelia to talk about the Riches Project and the Riches Toolkit. Sorry, Siddharth, you can go to the previous slide first. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Deepa, I appreciate it. Perfect. Um, so, you know, just to kind of give a little background, um, Chris and Deepa presented um, about a year's worth of research. And so really all of um, what we're going to be presenting um, moving forward is, as well as the video that you just saw, is really based um, on evidence and, and global research that was completed in order um, to spend the next year uh, developing uh, the tools and then the following year piloting the tools. And so not only was it, you know, based on um, a lot of uh, field work as well as desk research of, of what are the, the best practices on this very uncommon intersection of of harmful child work and 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 uh, women's economic empowerment um, but also tested out um, in the field in a in a different way considering covid but um we just wanted to give kind of that that context but you know really what we are what we are looking is to um, build awareness that is one of the big things that we noticed is that um, among women's economic empowerment actors um, you know and as chris really well pointed out with that statistic of 70 percent of harmful child work happening within the informal 
medical sector, um, it is something that that as a as a wee actor, there isn't very high level of awareness or um, you know really what what is the role for them to play, and so that's kind of where we we start from um, the riches toolkit to be able to address these these critical issues um, because we actors you know uh, our service providers that are supporting women's businesses, there's a lot of different roles that they can play, whether they're coming from um, a women's business um, aspect or livelihoods in agriculture. Um, we're, you know, speaking about financial service providers, as well as investors who are investing um, within these different types of organizations. Really, everybody has, has a role to play. Um, and as Deepa very well mentioned, you know, we're really looking for a set of minimum standards and then some additional tools for people who want to take it a little bit a step further. But that first step is the awareness building. And so really being aware of the risks of potentially doing harm when they're supporting women's enterprises, being able to assess the risks in different types of situations of harmful work for children and adults, um, then finding the place to link out to appropriate support services. You know, child labor and, and, and working conditions are a very complex issue and the causes are, are big issues, you know, whether it's poverty, whether it's um, facing shocks, poor education, all the like. And so we're really encouraging we actors to link to other support services, whether it's to other private sector or government programs or other NGOs, um, so that not one organization feels like they need to solve all the problems, but also to really leverage um, the power of partnership. And then finally committing to do no harm. And so really being able to, um, you know, say that we are monitoring both sides of the coin, not only um, intended consequences, but unintended consequences. And so um, as a result of this, we've um, prepared um, a lovely toolkit, which I'll present to you now, if I can have the next slide, um, so that you can kind of see how, how we uh, structured in this and how to walk this through. So here's kind of our, our high level. We have these three big boxes, big categories, um, based on the logic that because there is so much internal work that needs to be done at an organizational level, and that awareness building that I had mentioned, the first two phases are really around um, the organizational processes and focused on the organization and staff itself. And so in the first phase, we're really setting the foundation. And this is what we're kind of, um, we also refer to as our, our minimum package. So here's kind of the the basic, if you don't want to do any harm, if you want to understand your risks, um, these are the tools that you would use under this phase. And we're really trying to encourage this as any organization can do it. And the tools are designed to be used in a way that there isn't a heavy lift um, so that it can be really quickly done within an organization, basically with, with some staff time and, and some data from, uh, from internal sources. Then moving on to building the structure in phase two, here's where we start to involve additional staff. Um, so kind of moving from, um, from management, which is in phase one, to now really expanding beyond and including field staff. And so here we're asking organizations to build awareness of um, really their entire structure and their, their entire uh, human resources, as well as beginning to interact with their uh, clients or beneficiaries by gathering information and being able to improve any products and services. So then when we have the house in order, you know, we've got a good strong foundation, the walls have been lifted, um, then we move into now we're actually ready to engage with participants, with clients, with beneficiaries. And so here, our phase three is really that engagement. So here we're having people over, here they're welcome to the house because everything's in order, everything's clean, uh, we can have a party basically. And so this is where we have a lot of our, our awareness building on a participant level as far as um, trainings and dialogue as well as uh, risk assessments for the business level. So uh, and when, I, when I jump to the next slide, you'll see a lot of these tools. The intended user is the actual woman's entrepreneur, whereas in the other phases, it's more the organization uh, management and staff level. So if I could have the next slide. So here's uh, now the toolkit with all of its um, names and, and glory um, of everything that's been developed as well. So now you can see it kind of in the 
in the phase structure. So um, with phase one is where we want folks to start. Um, here is the management level awareness and understanding of organizational um, risks and harmful work for children and adults that could potentially be happening. So as a total to just kind of, you know, what is the overarching? Um, the, the Riches team has put together 13 tools um, and you'll see that some of them um, come in the paper in the digital version like we saw in the video. And so that's kind of the whole, the whole all of it. And then um, we have some tools that overlap between phase one and phase two that are just used slightly differently depending on, on the audience. So the making the case presentation is what you've been participating in right now. It's really um, the first step in building awareness and understanding the issues, presenting the data and the research, and really starting to get people into the, um, the movement of, hey, there is a place for me to be able to act and to really understand the issues at hand. Then we have two risk assessments, and these are internal risk assessments to, or to understand on an organizational or on a portfolio level, what are the risks that we are, um, we are potentially exposed to as an organization or that we're exposing our uh, participants to. And so it walks through kind of a, a series of, of questions in the form of a, a checklist and, and has recommendations of where to gather information if it's not readily available to be able to sort of assess, you know, what is the, the risk level, low, medium, and high, and start thinking about some of those action items. Um, then we have our social performance management guide. So you'll see that this is in both phase one and phase two. Here, we're only asking uh, for organizations to do the SPM assessment, which is a series of indicators that basically uh, look to show how you are, how your organizational mission is committing to policies and practice. So this is definitely um, really looking on that policy level as an organization. Understanding harmful work, you'll see that this is also in phase one and two. This is a training um, in this case for management only. And then later we recommend this for all staff. And so this is really, you know, considered kind of a, a primer. Um, it really delves into the issues and so that people just feel much more comfortable and aware of the difference between child labor versus child work, understanding, you know, what, um, as, as Chris had mentioned, the three Ds, what that looks Looks like a little bit more specifically, um, you know, looking at some international and national statistics to be able to really um, feel more comfortable ar around the topics. The linkages guide as well, this is um, in phases one and in phase three. Here we're encouraging organizations to have an emergency and external support contact list. Um, and then later creating linkages with other organizations. But in this first phase, you know, at a minimum, an organization should have a really good list of what are all the different support services so that in the case of detecting an issue with their participants or in the case of someone expressing a need, they can quickly refer them, whether it's to social services, government services, um, women's support and gender-based violence services, and, you know, whatever, whatever the organization isn't offering themselves Themselves, but to be able to um, quickly channel them to those resources. And then the investor's guide, which is for um, investors only, which is focused on how investors are making their investments as well as evaluating their risks um, when they are investing in reactors. And so here we provide suggestions around due diligence, around indicators that they can ask for and monitoring and evaluation um, to really help them make better investments and make sure that um, a lot of pieces are, are in place. There's um, new regulation coming out of the European Union as well as um, the, the IFC um, that are requiring investors to be able to really look into and understand how prevalent is harmful child work and working conditions. So then under phase two, um, as I had mentioned, this is where front, frontline awareness. Um, unmuted if we could quickly. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, perfect. So here we're building frontline staff level awareness and really prioritizing how we can improve products or create new products and services. So I'd already mentioned um, the social performance management guide. You know, what, a, what an organization would go into here is really issues around safeguarding and gender policies, which are the additional tools um, within this guide, uh, training the rest of the staff and really doing some market research here. So going out into the field and 
gathering information um, from participants, from other sources, from field staff, to be able to understand how prevalent are these issues, how are women coping, and what is the potential unintended consequences of the products and services that are being offered. The financial services guide is complementary to this because it really helps outline what are the benefits and what are the consequences of using a myriad of financial products and services. And so we've gone one by one and based on research and evidence, um, you know, what is the potential issues around a credit product, around a savings product, around um, transfers, remittances, so that an organization really has a good guide when they're looking at the specific design of a financial product to make sure they're not falling into any of those pitfalls. And then in the design workshop, we take both of these tools, the market research guide and the financial services guide, and management sits down together and really has a discussion around, you know, are our products and services designed in the best way possible to address the needs that people are expressing or express the to, to mitigate the risks that people are facing, and if not, to make adjustments to current products or create new ones. Then under um, phase three, here we're at a participant level awareness and supporting their needs. So now talking specifically about women entrepreneurs and, um, and being able to support them. Um, as I had mentioned under the linkages guide, the idea here is to create meaningful linkages with other organizations to be able so, to support women. We have a business diagnostic guide, which comes in a paper as well as digital version. And so here the idea is that we can diagnose business by business, specifically what are the physical, chemical, developmental, psychological, and risks to education for a specific business. And so um, women would come out with a, you know, a list of potential issues based on what their business is focused on, have a little bit of an action plan and in the digital version as well, they'll under, still receive tips along the way of the different risks that they face so that they can make some of those um, steps in the right direction to reduce those risks. The intra-household dialogue guide is uh, focused on women and their spouses or women and the decision makers um, or the person in, in their lives that they're, they're running their business with to really sit down and start talking about these conversations that don't normally come up at the dinner table. So how are we going to ensure that all of our children have um, a, a proper education? How are we deciding the resource management within the business? What are the potential risks around harmful child work um, that we may be facing and how can we how can we mitigate or avoid them? And so it's really designed to be a conversation with a, you know, uh, it could be either, you know, a handful of couples or it can be done on a community dialogue to really open up the conversation and, and be able to um, make an action plan around these different issues that women uh, face in their businesses. The risky business curriculum, it also comes in a paper and digital version. So you saw um, we have uh, six sessions in paper and six sessions in digital that can be facilitated in a group setting, uh, which is the paper version or digital ones that can be done um, individually, basically is how we have it, have it split up. And so these are really focused around the different types of risks that people face, um, thinking about our education, or also there's a, in the paper version, a session around um, trafficking and um, um, being able to really dive into these, these conversations directly with women entrepreneurs. And finally, our monitoring and evaluation guide, which really helps kind of tie up um, all of the tools and make sure that they're being used and, and iterated and that we're gathering the information um, around what we're trying to achieve within, um, within mitigating risks, as well as um, being able to um, support women in their businesses. And so here we have uh, a series of tools that include um, indicators and include different types of checklists and pieces that we use along the way um, so that there can be a robust monitoring of how this is going. So that's the uh, entire toolkit. And now I'm very pleased to pass it on to Bobby Gray, who's gonna um, delve into one of these tools and give you a little bit more information. Thank you. Great, thanks Amelia. Um, just watching the time, I wanna make sure that we're also leaving um, plenty of time for discussion. So I won't um, spend too much time here, but one of the reasons why we wanted to share, a, go in depth on one more tool, you've already seen some aspect of the risky business curriculum with the video um, earlier, but the social performance management guide um, 
was really designed as one of the first tools that an organization should use so that you could really get your house in order. And so it has um, four different tools in it. The first one is the social performance management um, assessment or the SPM assessment that um, Amelia mentioned earlier. And this is the piece of the tool or the, of the guide that we want people to do in phase one, because it really is a checklist of how well does your organization perform against a set of standards. This tool was developed um, as an adaptation of the social performance task forces, um, what they call the SPI uh, tool, but it's built on a series of universal standards of social performance management that have been used within the financial sector, um, probably been around for about 10 years. And so during this time period, we've been able to work with them to actually strengthen the standards that the financial services sector um, would be assessing themselves against. And we thought that these standards um, are applicable really across any sort of organization. And so it asks questions, for example, do you have a safeguarding policy? Do you have a gender policy? Do you um, collect uh, data on both the benefits as well as the unintended consequences of your work when you are doing client satisfaction surveys, client exit surveys, um, outcome surveys, et cetera. Um, and so it's really a tool that um, you can assess the strengths and weaknesses of your organization, whether it's just looking at the policy level, looking at the design of products and services, um, your human resources um, within the organization, um, et cetera. The second tool within this toolkit is really just a proposal of survey questions that a women's economic empowerment actor could integrate into their data collection processes. One of the you know, interesting aspects of um, a lot of the research that we've done over the past several years is you know, really realizing that we do a lot of data collection in terms of what we want to see. You know, are women, um, just like the slide that Chris presented earlier about you know, the intended consequences, we see a lot of data collection around that and very little data collection around what we don't want to see or the possible unintended consequences. So we propose some questions that organizations could integrate into existing data collection efforts. And then we propose a gender policy template. So this really kind of builds off of a, a gender policy that Grameen Foundation has, and we put it forward as somewhat of a template so that organizations could get a sense of what a gender policy might look like. And we actually build it um, off of the, there's an organization that um, has proposed different types of gender standards. And so we've adapted those for Green's purposes um, and put, for, put this forward as an option so that people could use it either for inspiration or to just generally get a sense of what a gender policy might look like. And even though the Riches Toolkit really focuses primarily on you know, child protection one of the things we recognize that if you're working with women and you're working in women's economic empowerment, that the organization should have some sort of articulation of the values they have about serving women in, in, um, um, in other um, populations. And then finally, we propose a safeguarding policy. So right now, this one is actually built on the safeguarding policy that ABA really has that um, has informed the safeguarding activities under the Women and Girls Empowered um, project that we also are partnering with ABA on, so the WAGE project. And we are calling out for the user of this guide that the labor and child protection is really where if they were using this toolkit, they might focus um, their attention on that particular standard so that they could get a sense of what they might need to integrate into their existing um, policies. And so these are the, the four different tools within the SPM guide. And as Amelia indicated, in the first phase, we really want people to focus on just doing an assessment and understanding what their strengths and weaknesses are against a set of standards, and then going deeper into this um, by incorporating some of these other um, components, as these are actually in order to demonstrate um, your social performance as an organization, these tend to be the, the, the three tools at the bottom, tend to be the, the pieces that organizations tend to not have. So they may have a lot of the other 
um, practices that we're proposing, but at least what we're trying to do is fill the gap in tools that may exist um, out there that um, people can use for inspiration to strengthen their social performance management. So while, since you guys have actually been um, listening quite a bit um, during this presentation, what I wanted to do is actually um, invite you to participate in a Mentimeter. And then when we complete this, we'll open it up for questions um, for some Q&A. So I'm going to sit, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And so during this Mentimeter, we have a few, um, questions for you, but then we're actually going to participate in a quiz show. So I hope you have really paid attention um, during this so that you can win um, the quiz show. So let me present first of all. So in order for you to get online, and I understand that several of Many of you have probably participated in these before, so hopefully this will be pretty easy. Um, you can either do this on your computer or your uh, personal mobile phone, and you can go to minty.com and enter the code um, at the bottom, or you can take a snapshot of the QR code. So I'm actually gonna also do the QR code. So this will give you just a few seconds to get yourself online so that you can participate. I'll give everybody as long as it also takes me um, to get online so that you can um, actively participate. I'll give about 10 more seconds and then we'll move on to the questions that we have. And so the first few are to gather a little bit of information from you um, as a reaction to the presentation today and then we'll do a brief quiz show. Okay. And the, um, as we go to the next slides, if you haven't been able to get on yet, the at least the minty.com, like the web address and the code will be at the top of the screen. Okay, so the first question, oops, let's see, where am I at the question? Okay, so the first question that we have is just which group do you represent? We understand that there are several different groups within the ABA that have been invited. And so we were curious to see um, where the majority of you are coming from. Give everybody a few seconds to answer this one. And I know there's about 20 people in the conversation, so hopefully we can get most of you um, onto the Minty. And if you're having difficulty, I would say just unmute yourself since I'm sharing my screen and can't see if you're having any problems getting on. And at the top of the slide, in case you missed the QR code, you can just go to menti.com and up on top, they'll ask you to input a code. So you can put an 87801531 and that'll help. Um, and that's another way of accessing it if you're on your computer or, or, or on your cell phone. Thank you, Millie. Okay, there we go, we're seeing a few more. So it looks like the majority, at least of those who have responded so far um, are from ABA Rowley. Or maybe it's a Tuesday morning evening and we don't remember what organization or group we're from. It's a valid problem. We're all looking forward to the holidays. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Thank you for that one. Okay, so now the question that we have for you is just out of the, especially the, um, the slide that Amelia had talked you through, um, which of the tools do you feel will be most relevant to your work? So if you think about the risk assessment, the SPM guide that um, I shared a little bit more on, the market research guide, investors guide, risky business, m and &E guide, et cetera, which of the tools do you think will be most relevant for your work? Very good. We have about seven people that have responded so far. Give you a few more seconds on this one.
Great. So many of you have um, think that the understanding harmful work training would be valid um, or helpful and relevant to your work. And I would agree. Actually, I've um, as coming into this as a women's economic empowerment actor, this one has definitely been one that I go back to um, pretty often to remind myself of um, some of the distinctions that we're making between child work and harmful child work. Great, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next slide. So this is the final one before um, we go into the quiz show. And so if you're not on Mentimeter yet, I hope that you get there because I wanna make sure you compete against your colleagues. So the um, last question that we have before we go there is just to what degree will the Riches Toolkit be relevant for your own work? Just curious, um, especially given from all of the different groups that you're coming from. A few more seconds to answer this one. Very good. So it seems the majority um, think to a medium degree that this will be relevant. And I think some of this will become a little clearer once you're able to access um, the tools. And I think, and I, I think right before we went into this, I think maybe Mary Margaret had um, dropped a link or I could be imagining that. Um, but as, as we've been producing the tools, um, we're not yet at the point where they've been approved by the US Department of Labor to post them, but because we've really been working actively with different um, implementing organizations to design and pilot and get feedback on the tools, they have, we've um, kept them pretty open source. And that's the intent is that all of the tools will be up on what we're calling the Riches Portal on the Grameen website um, that people will be able to access in Word documents with um, the hopes and expectations that people will adapt these for their own purposes. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the quiz show. So I hope um, your brains are ready, your hands are quick so that you can answer the questions. And let's see who, um, paid most attention during the presentation. So you're gonna have a, a four questions and you're gonna have a few seconds to answer each question and then we'll be able to see how you compare to each other. Okay, so I'm gonna start the countdown and you'll, you should see the question on your screen. So the first question is how much more time do women spend on domestic capacity? Are they equal? Is it two times more or three times more? That's seven is still leading the way. All right. Next question. Which of the following is not a tool?
anybody want to claim who was uh, St. Nicholas in the competition? Who was the winner? At the risk <laughs> of being win. accused of being an insider. <laughs> Happy St. Nicholas, Mary everyone. Margaret, woohoo! Way to go, Mary Margaret. I'm glad <laughs> you were participating <laughs> and paying attention. Good job. Um, great. So now we'll just transition over to any questions that you have or comments about um, the presentation. Given the small group that we have here, I think it would probably be fine if you just want to raise your hand and we'll call on you or feel free if you're more comfortable um, to just put them in um, the chat box. Any questions or comments or ideas about um, how these may be relevant to your own work? Maybe Bobby, while, while folks are thinking about it, I could okay. throw a, a question out. Um, so we know that the team did a lot of work with pre and post test results, uh, pre and post testing. So um, maybe you could share some of the findings from that, from the toolkit implementation trainings um, that the, the group might find useful, particularly in regards to, to staff or, or clients. Um, mm -hmm. um, so Amelia, you and Chris might have more ideas of the um, pre and post tests that we've probably done with the risky business, right? And with the education. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you want to share? Yeah, yeah my pleasure. That? My pleasure. Um, so we've, we've run... Um, We've run the risky business a couple of times, as well as um, as well as really kind of on the understanding harmful work. And so, you know, across across the board, um, I would say that there the the first point was was um, some decent data points and in, in knowledge change that improved o over um, a pre and a post test and being able to really work on the kind of awareness and the attitude um, raising, you know, kind of what we're hearing the most from, um, and, and we just heard it again today is that, you populations, many of them were either in child labor or close to um, as children themselves. So even managers and, and support staff that we've spoken to. And so really breaking down what that means and then, um, you know, some of the biases as well that come along with that has been one of the most important uh, conversations and, and awareness building tools that we've been able to detect, you know, across the board, um, you know, as we're working on a, on a country level and and a field level. Um, and so really that that attitude piece, and you know, we heard it as well in, in, in Nigeria, and we heard it um, in El Salvador and the Philippines of, you know, that some of these activities are seen as character building or responsibilities to the family or to be able to, um, you know, afford their education. And so really talking on a personal level so that people are, are able to start making that distinction and, and understanding a little bit better where the line is. And so that, you know, where, where does something that is a chore or something that's part of, you know, their formation is crossing over um, based on, you know, the criteria that Kristen Deepa had mentioned is, is really an important um, data piece that we've been able to gather. Great. Thank you, Amelia. Any other comments or questions? be curious to hear, uh, you know, especially since the um, social performance management guide and the understanding harmful work, those seemed as, as tools um, that folks found would be interesting. I'd, I'd love to see in your reaction to any specific programs that um, you could see them as useful or anything along those lines as well. If people want to let us know in the chat. And Mary Margaret, since um, this is kind of your first time, I think to actually go all the way through the presentation um, as well, even though you helped get us organized, I'm curious just from um, your position at ABA Rowley, kind of where you see this may fit um, with the work that you guys do. Um, well, I think that it was a bit telling uh, in terms of uh, participants 
uh, response to the Mentimeter. I think we're very much at the awareness phase um, in a lot of ways. And I would think that this first, you know, the first pillar uh, of the tool, the toolkit um, is a good starting point, obviously, for folks um, both at HQ who are helping to manage programs which we know mo many, if not most of which are not specifically focused um, in the we arena, but to be able to look at that and see how it's applicable to the work um, that's being done in, in different um, arenas. And then certainly with our colleagues who are working um, in the field as well, because that's where there's the contextual awareness and the applicability um, that, that can happen. Um, so I, in, in some ways, I mean, I would love to hear from, from our colleagues on the call as well, kind of to Amelia's point, if what your initial reactions or thoughts are um, in terms of seeing um, either a direct applicability or areas of adaptability and, and maybe the Grameen team too, if you have thoughts to share with us um, on where you see some of the tools potentially being adapted to promote child protection, but um, outside of the arena or adjacent to the arena of uh, specifically women's economic empowerment. I think that could be kind of some interesting insights and exchange. Well, maybe while people are thinking, um... You know, Mary Margaret, you you're saying something that I think even for Grameen Foundation, um, you know, working within women's economic empowerment, um, the one of the throughout this entire project, one of the biggest pieces of pushback has really been the distinction between child work and child labor. I mean, even our own country staff, when we introduced the Riches Project, you know, what is it, three years ago, um, mm -hmm. you know immediately had pushed back. And, and actually, it was interesting that even our communications team was a little bit hesitant to even talk about this project because, you know, you're talking about the unintended consequences of the work that we've been doing, you know, for decades. Um, and some of our own field staff, um, you know, immediate reaction was, well, how can you tell people that their children cannot work? You know, that's just the way of life. And Chris was pointing this out earlier. And even though we've yet to do the understanding harmful work um, training within Grameen, it's it's something that we feel like will be necessary, just not only about child protection, but you know, because we also work across the, the wage and the riches project with ABA Rowley, um, you know, a lot of the tools that we've designed, I believe can be really applicable to the work that ABA Rowley does around gender-based violence, because even though we've had to frame everything around child protection for this particular project. We also have kept in mind um, the other unintended consequences that you would just redirect the framing of the use of the tool, um, you know, towards you know the unintended consequences that you might have on gender-based violence, or um, you know, like Chris put earlier about the slide about you know if you're working in the environment or. Um, you know, some of the green sectors, you know, a lot of the tools have applicability for use in those areas as well. So I would, you know, I think as I would, if I were advising ABA Rowley, um, I think looking at the tools for that purpose would probably be really useful because we've kind of kept that in mind um, as we've designed them because we're kind of sitting in between these two projects. But that makes a lot of sense too, right? And as we all have increased awareness, um, and certainly within ABA Rowley to the safeguarding piece and the uh, safeguarding policy that we're going to be rolling out soon. So this is, uh, you know, it, encompassing part of that umbrella, you know, the do no harm and safeguarding and then continuing to just be much more intentional um, about these aspects and certainly the unintended consequences in this realm. Mm -hmm. Mary Margaret, maybe this is a question for you. If ABA labor section is working with any organization in Liberia or anyone in the ABA? Um, to be totally honest, I don't know given the size of the ABA. So that's something we can research. Uh, the, I don't think anyone joined us today from the, the labor section um, at ABA, um, but we can follow up on that and, and see.
So there's a few minutes left. If there are any other um, questions or comments before I turn it back over to Sid and Mary Margaret to close us out. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to mention that um, we've shared our research in the in the chat as well, and so um, we have global research that um, encompassed really all those be best practices and, and information gathered that Chris and Deepa uh, mentioned at the beginning as well. And um, I'm sharing the the preview of the portal where nothing is there yet, um, but <laughs> we'll be giving we'll be giving some access there. So we just wanted to you know open up the conversation as um, and and give you as many resources as possible so we can kind of continue working on these issues together. Great. Thanks, Amelia. And then Mary Margaret, I can't, um, I'm realizing now that I did um, skim back through the chat. Have you already shared the box folder with there? Okay, perfect. So I would just I encourage, sent, yeah, go ahead. I know I did. I sent it yesterday with a reminder email to, okay, to everyone perfect. who we'd invited. So, uh, it's, it's out there. And then uh, what Amelia shared in the chat box for everyone, I encourage uh, to, to keep hold of that uh, since uh, you know, things are still in development. And the, uh, it's you know, grateful to Grameen, I think, for the open source approach to this and, and providing access to the, the tools as they currently are, particularly for um, uh, you know, ABA colleagues who are, are newer to the subject matter. So that gives an opportunity to, to look through at various stages. Um, and then, of course, Keep folks informed and can also check back to the portal link that Amelia shared um, once the, the toolkit is finalized. Great. Thank you. Well, and we equally invite any comments or questions. Um, if you get into the tools and you have questions about their use um, and the languages that they're available in, some of them, not all of them will, will be translating into Spanish in French and Filipino, but we hope we're going to get as many of them um, done so that you know there's just a broader global applicability and relevance of the tools as well. So at least from the Grameen side, I'll say you know thank you for all of your participation today, and um, we look forward to the continued collaboration with ABA Rowley finishing out the Riches project, and then of course um, throughout the next several years with the Wage um, Consortium. So look forward to um, continuing to work with many of you. Well, and I thank all of you. So we thank our colleagues from Grameen, I thank Chris uh, and Deepa as well for the presentation. Really rich, um, I think, uh, exciting, motivating information, um, definitely. Um, and uh, thanks to all our colleagues who have participated. I know we've had several folks who've had to drop off uh, for other meetings as well. Um, but thanks to all of you who have participated for your interest and for your time. Um, and we'll look forward to remaining in touch and continuing to funnel information to you. And as um, Bobby and Amelia have said, you know, be available for questions um, and, and follow up going forward. So uh, thanks to everyone. Wish you all very well and, and good rest of the week um, and take care. <laughs>